It's, a, it's an honor to be with all of you today, and I hope you can hear me. Let me know if you can't. Um, I, I'm really very, very honored to be here. Uh, Kate um, mentioned that, you know, I might be busy and I have a busy practice and it might have been a hardship to be on today. No, it, it's really, it's really quite, um, it means a lot to me to be on today, I'll put it that way. Um, so uh, I am humbly grateful for the opportunity to speak with all of you, to meet you finally. I've, I've met many of you, uh, some in person and some online, uh, and I've read the things that you've said and learned a lot from what you've said in my interactions with you. And um, when Kate and, and I were talking about a topic for today, we both decided I loved this bar. I said, really, I would love to talk about what I've learned from people living with dementia because I, 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 that has enriched my life so much and it's made me a better physician, a better person. And she said she thought that would work well. So uh, first of all, uh, I want to, um, by way of disclaimer, tell you that I should be listening to what you all say today, not you listening to me. Um, but I, I, I do want to share my experience uh, as a care partner, as a neurologist, uh, tell you my dad's story, and um, uh, talk to you a little bit about what I've learned. And I hope I've been a good student, so I, I will find out. And please uh, don't hesitate to let me know uh, if I say something that is inconsistent with the experience that you've had or that um, that I need to be corrected on I'm very open to that so um, again happy to happy to be here um, so faces faces of change so um, the encounter with faces and by faces I mean human beings um, has been very profound for me over the years um, uh, and we'll talk about that today. I, I want to tell you a little bit of the background on me. I'm from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, which is the home of the University of Alabama. Uh, it's in the western part of Alabama, and it's uh, on Central uh, Standard Time. And uh, I live uh, here with my wife, Ellen, and uh, I have two college-age daughters. One has just graduated. One is in college now, actually out for the summer. Uh, and a little miniature dachshund, Heidi. So uh, uh, that's, that's the family here. My mother, who is a, was the primary care partner from my father, still is living here in Tuscaloosa. She's 85 and doing very, very well um, as well. So that's where I'm coming from. Um, I want to talk about some objectives that uh, I'd like to cover today in the talk. This talk is a little bit different than a lot of um, maybe academic talks you might hear. Uh, in that I'm going, it's going to be very experiential. I'm going to be telling you about our experience, and I'm going to be talking about some data and some literature, yes, but I'm going to be mainly telling stories about uh, our experience, and, and I, hope that's, uh, I hope that's okay for today. But I'd like to start out talking about the fallacy of diminishing personhood as the root cause of stigma related to dementia, uh, which I believe is the case. Uh, in other words, I believe that's the root cause of stigma. Uh, I want to describe one neurological experience as a secondary care partner or a loved one living with dementia and the destigmatizing effect of that relationship. I'd like to uh, people to the exam father Lester the power of the expressive arts and creativity would promote well-being and maintain relationships for persons living with dementia uh, I want to summarize the lessons learned and subsequent changes in practice that I have made based upon my personal care partner experience with dad and upon subsequent meaningful interactions with persons living with dementia and then offer some suggestions that providers might uh, adopt for the goal of helping people to live well. 
And then I'd like to discuss some realistic expectations uh, that persons living with dementia and care partners could have of their health care providers. And hopefully that will be helpful uh, for, uh, for you as well. I always like to offer some disclosures. I have consulted with Embodied Labs, which is a virtual reality company on the development of some dementia training modules. And uh, as was mentioned, I have formed with my wife and family a not-for-profit entity called Cognitive Dynamics, through which I'm able to do my work uh, of this kind. And then with my wife, Ellen Potts, uh, we did form a caregiver care partner education company, Dementia Dynamics, and published a book, A Pocket Guide for the Alzheimer's Caregiver, a few years back. And so Ellen is very much my partner in all that we do uh, as well. So faces change us. Um, I've included three quotes that are very meaningful to me that certainly have been my experience. Um, one of them is from philosopher Emmanuel Levinas, who said the dimension of the divine opens forth from the human face. And a lot of Levinas's work is very powerful and uh, his, his uh, delineations of, of, of what he means by that. Um, Berbrev said, being touched by vulnerable, uh, we no longer can remain indifferent. We are called to responsibility. And then Simone Campbell says, touching that which causes us to weep can liberate the transforming fire of hope within us. Um, I am coming to find out through the course of this that the spiritual side of things and the philosophical side of things for me uh, are very, very powerful. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about it and writing about it. Uh, Dr. Albert Schweitzer said, the true worth of a person is not to be found in the person, him or herself, but in the colors and textures that come alive in others. And the gentleman that you see on the right of the PowerPoint is my father, Lester E. Potts, Jr., uh, dad was born in 1928, November the 4th, and passed on September the 15th, 2007. And that is a photograph that was made during the Korean War, in which dad participated in 1951. Um, you see to the left of one of dad's paintings that we like to call Beyond the Sunset. And I will tell you that... Um, Lester had some pretty rich colors uh, in, in the deep recesses of his heart and mind. And those colors showed themselves uh, when he had Alzheimer's disease. And therefore, uh, they lit up, I'll acknowledge uh, the very strong character and integrity, and pardon me if I get choked up, okay? But I will acknowledge the very strong character, integrity, and central identity of this man, Lester Potts, okay? And I, I, I have the utmost honor for him. I had with video the other day when Kate and I were practicing, so I may not be able to play the video. I'm going to try briefly, and if, and if it doesn't work, Kate, please tell me, and I'm gonna go ahead and move on. Um, but this is a video that was um, done about dad and our story uh, a few years ago by a student in Alabama here. Kate, I don't think it's gonna work, so I'm just gonna move past it, okay? Okay, thanks, Daniel. Sorry about that. Um, so I will fill you in on what the video basically said. So dad, um, a sawmill worker, um, began to have the earliest signs of dementia uh, in the late 1990s, uh, about the age of 70. And his earliest signs were short-term memory loss uh, and some personality changes. Um, we 
uh, recognized some of those things, but I was in denial or either blew them off or didn't, wasn't perceptive enough. So I just blamed it on a move that he'd had or a surgery that he'd had um, or some life's changes he was going through. So dad retired from the, from the sawmill, the lumber business, moved from their small town to Tuscaloosa where we were and uh, started a life here in Tuscaloosa. Dad, having been a strong worker all of his life, got the job uh, at, in retirement parking cars at a local physician's office building. Unbeknownst to me uh, or my mother, Dad began to lose cars, lock keys in cars, wander around in the parking deck lost. Um, his co-workers couldn't depend on him, which was completely unlike anything Dad had experienced before. And uh, he had a couple of fender benders and had some difficulty seeing himself. Went on over a period of a couple, I'd say about a year and a half. And so um, my good friend, who is an attorney, Dallas, um, who happened to be dad's supervisor, um, called me up one day at my office and said, I need to come talk to you. Are you what's going on with your dad? I said, no, not really. So she came to my office and told me what was going on with dad. And um, it, was a, it was a very important day. And she said, I'm breaking employment law to tell you these things probably, but you know what? This is more important because you need to know this. And so um, I thanked her and uh, talked to dad on the phone that afternoon. And he said, son, I'm not gonna work there anymore. I decided uh, that I wanted to spend my retirement with your mother and we're gonna enjoy that. And I said, dad, I think that's the, the thing you should do. You worked hard all your life. And I hung up the phone and fell apart. And I later heard from mother that dad did the same because this was the first time that dad had ever had to admit being in the job. This was someone who they had to hire three young guys to take his place in the sawmill. You know, this was a, this was a, and so I began to be, to deal with the fact that dad was no longer um, able to do those things. and. Um, also to deal with the fact that I felt like a failure myself because I had not recognized this problem as early as I should have. So um, it was a day of reckoning. After that, we got a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and we got some treatment started and we got dad plugged into some, and mother plugged into some community resources. Um, so I'm telling all of this in great vulnerability with all of you because I want you to understand that, um, you know, I'm, I'm a son, an only child. And, uh, you know, I wasn't, uh, wasn't ready to, wasn't ready to see that. I wasn't ready to, to try to deal with that, come to terms with that. And so there we go. And, uh, but after that, um, we got, got, got dad plugged into some, some resources. The most important thing that we did, I think, was to um, enable dad to go to an adult daycare facility in our community called Caring Days. And Caring Days is a, is a wonderful place. And I knew of Caring Days because I had referred others to that place. And um, I we determined that it was would be good for dad to go because dad was becoming very hard to handle at home. He was depressed. He couldn't do the things that he used to do. Mother was having a hard time and she wanted to hang on as long as possible. But we finally said, you know what? Let's try this. And dad actually thought he was going down to make some repairs at Caring Days. He was going to help them down there because we talked about what well, Caring Days is renovating. Well, I'll go help. So dad agreed to do that. Took his toolbox the first day down there. But what happened at Caring Days changed all of our lives. So dad was accepted for who he is now. He was given opportunities to do things that he could still do well. He was not expected to do things he couldn't do well. He was exposed to art and music and 
of those of art. And what happened was his dad found himself through his art. And so we'll get back to that in just a second. But that's how we got to, um, that's, that's the important part of the story that got us to dad finding himself at the Dementia Daycare Center. So, stigma. Well, one definition of stigma is the disapproval of or discrimination against a person based on perceivable characteristics that serve to distinguish them from other members of society. Well, I think the root cause of stigma associated with Alzheimer's and other dementias is the belief, perhaps unacknowledged, that people living with dementia somehow embody less personhood than others who don't have the dementia. That under a person less a person than before they received the diagnosis, as if personhood could be diminished by any circumstance or condition at all. Um, so I, I, um, I have spent the past several years trying to deal with what, what this may mean and what the concept of personhood may mean. And um, Anatoly Briard said, it may not be dying, we fear so much, but the diminished self. And I think that, um, that this even impacts how healthcare providers interact with, uh, with persons living with dementia. And so uh, there are a lot of ways to define personhood, um, and you see some of them there. But for me, and I, I'm just saying for me, I, I, I don't ask anyone else to adopt this definition, first of all. Um, I offer this definition as what I call a simple country neurologist from Backwoods, Alabama, who's been trying to grapple with this very deeply for the past decade. And I offer this definition as something that helps me in my own care partner journey and in my own occupation as a neurologist. And it's, you'll see that it is a spiritual definition, okay? So I think that personhood is the condition of being a person, a relational being created in the image of God and named by God who is sustained and will be eternally remembered through God's love and providence, who has the potential to grow more into the likeness of God through an ever-expanding capacity for love, compassion, and relationship. Now, if I see through the window of that definition, then I see that personhood is departed, is imparted, imparted. It cannot be gained or lost. It is not earned. It is sacred and carries inherent dignity. It is not dependent on productivity, morals, cognitive ability. And, you know, I am because God created me, sees me, and remembers me eternally. I am not because I can work. I am not because I can reason. I am not because I can um, work differential equations. I am because I am. And uh, this has helped me greatly in uh, being able to deliver the right kind of care to someone. Okay? Because the way I look at it is this. If I have that sort of opinion about what, what, a per, what being a person means, then I'm less apt to treat someone as if they're not a person. I'm less apt to treat someone as less than. I'm less apt to determine, oh, well, I don't need to visit her today. I'm, I'm less apt to diminish the care that I give or the quality of care that I give because personhood is implicit, inherent, and unfading. Okay, so that's that's kind of that's kind of the way I look at it. Um, I think this has profound implications for the way that that we treat individuals and in, you know in our society, the way persons living with dementia are treated 
I think it should call forth our finest and most compassionate efforts as care partners. And it means that we never give up on people living with dementia, no matter how far the progression, severe the disease, misunderstood the behavior, et cetera, because there are no human shells. My dad was not a human shell. The lady, the lady who talked to me this week about her mom, her mom is not a human shell. And I realized that we have methods of protecting our own selves. Uh, and, and, and we have mechanisms of, uh, we have boundaries that we have to put up and we have self-protecting behaviors. But we're, we're not human shells. Um, so I respect everyone who is the care partner who has not come to the point that they can fully consider what I've just said. I know that. There, there are gradations of this, and people have a tough time. But uh, I, I live into this. Now, all of you could talk to me about this, but I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say research suggests that personal identity persists. Now, I've had people living with dementia that tell me that on some days, it's some day, they may not know who they are. I, I understand that, but the, the, but the personal identity for the most part has been shown in some very elegant work by many researchers to persist. Um, to have an identity is to know who one is in cognition and feeling, to have some continuity with the past. There's a narrative that's present. There's a story that's present. Uh, certain aspects of relational identity may be lost. Um, as a result of how a person is viewed or treated. We'll talk more about that. Um, but we need to be story holders. When I say we, I and others who are not living with dementia need to be story holders for people that, uh, for people that have dementia. Um, I will use some quotes uh, from some uh, people that I'm familiar with who've lived with dementia. Dr. Christine Bryden, of course, uh, many people know know about her story. I love this. I can give an authentic experiential account of dementia from an insider's perspective, which provides alternative insights into the idea of loss of self. I explore continuing self embodied relationships within the community, and I retain the ability uh, to uh, find a sense of meaning in the present moment. My aim has been and continues to be to create a new world of possibility and redescribe reality uh, so that people with dementia can be seen in a very different way. A friend who's living with Alzheimer's disease, I'm still me. I know the face I and my family see in the mirror. Um, you know, I, I have no choice but to accept it. My family chooses to accept it. I do remember how much I love them and how much they love me. And I appreciate the friends that haven't deserted me with hopes that they never will. Brian says, I have Alzheimer's, but Alzheimer's doesn't have me. And, you know, I, there are many other quotes and many of you could wax poetic about this. Um, but I, I found working with people living with dementia um, and my dad, that if I can tap into personhood, uh, then I'm able to have a relationship. And some of the ways to tap into personhood are outlined here. Authentic relationships, supportive community, faith and spirituality, expressive arts, especially music. There's more data with music, but any of the expressive arts, pets uh, and other animals, intergenerational relationships, nature, uh, imagination and play. We never get too old to play. We have to be able to play. Reminiscence, humor, present moment centeredness, giving back to others, generativity, the need to give back always persists, and to live in ways that add meaning and purpose. These are some ways that, that I think we can tap in. 
Um, I love this quote because one of the things that I, I fly about is the way I held on to who I needed my dad to be, despite the fact that he couldn't be that any longer. And Madeline Langle says, because you're not what I would have you be, I blind myself to who in truth you are. It is not fair for me to hold someone to be accountable, to be who I need them to be, when they can't do that because they're living with dementia. So going along with that is entering into their world, um, loving the person I see now, um, but it's it's really an it's really ego work that I have to do. I mean, I've got I've got to set aside that expectation so that I can be in a relationship with the person who's there now, still the same person, but but not able to communicate and and, and navigate the world in which I live the way they used to. So I think Madeline Madeline laid laid, laid it down for us there, and so I think. What I observe, what I perceive, if I expect to see personhood, I'm more apt to find it. Um, Dr. Evan Alexander, who is a neurosurgeon who had meningitis and who found himself in a coma for a long period of time and eventually woke up, um, said the observing mind is absolutely crucial in the actuality that emerges as our perceived reality. George Berkeley, to be is to be perceived. If I look for it, I'm more apt to see it. I'm more apt to see it. I think that all of us have what I would call pillars of personhood so that each of us have self-defining attributes that, that we continue to possess. They may be harder to find if we are developing cognitive changes, but they're still there. And learning an appreciation for these pillars uh, will allow us to have relationships. I'll give you an example. I have a friend who is living with dementia. He's a voice professor. And although he can't do a lot of what he could do, he can still teach voice and teaches it amazingly well. And so one of the, one of the ways for his care partner to interact with him is around this uh, task and, con and, and talent and um, shared experience of teaching voice. And so this has enabled her to maintain a relationship with him. This is a pillar of his personhood. And so if we build a relationship around that, it will enable us to, uh, to be with him. And so a couple of psychologists, marriage family therapists, and I are working on a, um, an approach uh, a therapeutic approach for uh, uh, for family therapy, which we call the four pillars, and we're we're trying to identify psychological, physiological, spiritual, and relational aspects of this person that are still the same, so that we can build a relationship on on those. And so uh, we're still working on that. And part of it has to do with helping people find their strengths. Brendan Burchard says help focus on their strengths more than their limitations and we discover what's been missing themselves. Um, Maya Angelou said there's no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you and um, I think people living uh, with dementia often have this story that it's hard for them to tell and I think that um, if I can enable someone to tell their story searching for their pillars or, or what, then I've, I've done something good. Brene Brown says, owning our story and loving ourselves through that process is the bravest thing that we'll ever do. Uh, my dad told me that he was ashamed uh, because he had this condition. And it broke my heart, you know. But if I can help him own his story, live into identity, express his narrative and not be ashamed of it, then I've done something good. And that's what I'm gonna try, that's what I'm gonna, gonna try to do. 
Um, and Kate, let me know if I need to take a break or if I need to stop for a minute. Um, I'm happy to do that. Um, tend to just talk and talk. Um, many of you are familiar with Thomas Kitwood, I'm sure. His work has meant a lot to me as I've um, tried to learn a thing or two about um, about how to, to treat people. Uh, I, I love the, the philosophy that he had that dementia is really best understood as an interplay between neurological impairment and environment of care. So in other words, brain pathology only explains part of how, of how well somebody's able to do if they're living with dementia. A lot of it is, made, is, is determined by their social environment, context, the quality of their relationships. And so Kitwood says persons living with dementia exist in a state of relative well-being or ill-being based not only on, on neuropathology, but on the degree to which the following needs are met and he outlines these, their attachment, comfort, identity, occupation, and inclusion. And central to providing all of those is loving the person in the present state. And so um, I, I'm a believer that that's, that that's true. Dr. Sam Fazio, uh, whose book, The Enduring Self and Alzheimer's, was important for me early on uh, when we were um, learning, learning about dad's condition, um, has offered some practice recommendations for person-centered care, include, including knowing the person living with dementia. That's the most important. Recognize and accept the person's reality. Identify and support ongoing opportunities for meaningful engagement. Nurturing relationships. Create and maintain a supportive environment uh, for individuals, families, staff, and then practices regularly. So we could talk a lot more about people who've written about this, and there are many, many others. But for the second half of my talk, I would like to um, talk to you about the interactions that I've had, starting with Dad, and tell you some things I've learned from others. And uh, I'll go, what I want to do is show you a lot of dad's art as we're going along here so that I can, it's, it's going to be kind of like a museum tour of dad's art and um, some things that I want to pull out of dad's art. Dad had a good face. Dad was a good man. And um, the people at Caring Days had good faces. These are some of the folks in the upper right hand corner. You see George Parker. George Parker was dad's art teacher. George uh, is passed on himself. He was not an art therapist, but he had an innate uh, uh, way of being able to share his talent. And uh, George and Dad uh, had a great time together. Vicki Kerr, who is the lady in the center holding Dad's face, was the director of Caring Days, and she and Dad had a very special relationship. Vicki understands it. She gets it. Dad, toward the end, his facial expression changed. This was the dad. This was a few months before Dad passed on. Uh, I will tell you that the art helped Dad to save face. So Dad, when I look back at Dad and think about those days, I don't think about that face really as much as I think about Dad's beautiful art. So the art gave Dad the opportunity to express past, um, past that and to really express the content of his character. And here's some of Dad's amazing art. In the lower bottom hand corner there, you see his first painting. He showed it to her. Mom said, Lester, where'd you get that, honey? He said, I painted it myself. She'd never seen him paint anything. 50 years they'd been together. They had never drawn a picture. Dad had never done anything like that. He subsequently brings home things like that Blue Jay. I mean, my goodness, the, the ship. Now, this is something came out of Dad's head in his heart. And um, he just innately knew how to do this. And I, I suppose he would never have done it had he not, uh, had, he not had Alzheimer's. 
what came out of dad was his life story in many ways. And so dad, um, dad loved to build things. I've told you dad built bird houses. There's some bird houses that dad built prior to Alzheimer's disease. He used to give those to people in the community. His late stage Alzheimer's art, uh, dad had a birdhouse motif that he liked to paint over and over. So he was still building birdhouses late. Uh, there's also a birdhouse in that, in that blue picture there that he painted. This was very much a part of dad and it came out in his art. Dad loved fences. You see the bottom left hand corner, 1937, dad in a white suit and his uh, stern looking grandmother and his family there standing out front of the old home place. He loved fences, loved to build them, loved to repair them, and he painted them as well. Um, I love this. This is one of my favorite uh, things in all of Dad's art. So Dad had a good buddy named Albert Corder. Mr. Albert was older than Dad, but he worked in the sawmill with Dad for many years and helped to raise my father. And my dad continued loving Albert all of his life. One time dad told me late in the bad had in touch with Albert. He said, because Albert will take care of us. So this is the kind of relationship that he had with Albert. So this was a deeply held relational memory uh, for dad. So late in, late in, late in Alzheimer's disease, he actually couldn't tell me what he was painting at the time because he was so way phased. Painted a picture of Les pulling a crosscut saw like they did many, many years ago. Now, Dad couldn't tell me that was Albert, but I knew it was. And so I said, Dad, who is that? Dad put his hand on Albert, but didn't say anything. I said, Papa, is that your buddy Albert? He starts crying. Yes, it was Albert. Not only was it Albert, but he knew it was Albert. Now for me, that was very powerful because it demonstrated to me that the relational, the relational phenomenon still persisted for my dad it was still very important that he go back and revisit that relationship, you see. Now, Naomi File talks about this in her validation therapy. She talks about the need of people to go back and visit and, and, and be relational again with these individuals that have been important to them throughout their lives. I think dad was able to go back and the art, and I'm thankful that he had that opportunity. I call him Big Daddy. Uh, he was an old, I call him an old codger. That's what we say in the South. Uh, he, he was born in 1891. He was my best friend growing up. Big Daddy had a couple of, that's a, that's a picture from the 1980s. So had high top shoes, high top lace up shoes. So my dad would have pulled up on those shoes as an infant and would have remembered the old hat, okay? There's Big Daddy on a carriage, about 1920. You see one of Dad's birdhouses, and you see a cross-cut saw turned bottoms up. So these are images that would have been very important for my dad as a child. Now, this is Big Daddy later in life, and by the way, that's me. Uh, so there, and there's my dad, and there's Big Daddy, and there's his dad's grave. His dad died in 1895 of typhoid fever. And we took Big Daddy back to the grave. But the point is, that's a characteristic look. The hat, the shoes, he always looked like that. So, this is Dad's most well-known painting. It was painted in late-stage Alzheimer's. We call it the blue collage. Dad was unable to tell us what he was painting at this time and unable to complete a sentence, but he got great joy in painting. So let me show you some things about this piece of art. That image contains an upside down crosscut saw. That is a hat on top of a cross. And that a high top shoe. So this is the clock. 
abstract. This is Big Daddy. And uh, Dad, I believe, created that image volitionally. I believe that I believe that he meant to create that image. Um, again, I asked him if it was his dad, and he cried and put his hand on it. So I think that he was able to um, take himself back to a place of comfort and familiarity and a, and a powerful relationship that he had with his father and painted that image. I'm very thankful for this image. Uh, this image has done more to teach me than many, many words and many, many books. I'll just tell you that. I mean, I will, I will say so far, I'll go so far as to say as my practice changed, the day Papa brought home the blue collage, okay? Now, yeah, a picture's worth a thousand words. The blue collage is powerful. It also contains a little birdhouse, uh, some trees, some rocks, and some leaves. This is Dad's life story in watercolor art. The faces. You familiar with William Utamolan and his artistic depictions of himself, his self-portraits uh, from before and after he got Alzheimer's. Um, so I can't, I, I, I can't not acknowledge that. I have to acknowledge that. And for me, even though Dad's art was changing me, um, I was also not doing very well with all of this. And so I was experiencing what I'd call the big four, denial, resentment, self-pity, and exhaustion. And because I was framing what was happening wrongly, uh, I was seeing at that time only the suffering, the um, loss, and I, even though I saw the art, I was not, I was not framing, I was not framing things correctly. And so I, I burned out. I literally did. I had to have help. And so I came back from that experience because of the help that I got, because of the faces and lives of loved ones, because of the faces of friends and students and others. And, um, it, it really saved me. And so after dad passed on in 2007, we started a foundation called Cognitive Dynamics. And the first program we started was called Bringing Art to Life. And we started it when we created an experience that dad had. I, I wanted to create a situation in which other people could have the same kind of experience he had had at Terry Days. And so Bringing Art to Life pairs students with people living with dementia in an art therapy practical situation. So um, we teach the students about dementia, the various kinds of dementia. Uh, we talk to them about um, person-centered care. We teach them how to interact with people living with dementia. And we talk to them about art therapy. And then we have about 10 weeks of art therapy in which we all interact together and we create art. What happens during that time is everybody becomes everybody's friend. We're all in there together. We're not, we're not a dementia patient and a student. We're all partners and the kids are transformed in the experience. Uh, it, it, it changes them forever. And uh, it, it changes me watching it. Um, we know that, um, and I'm not going to play this video because it will work. The children, students who are entering health professions have opportunities to develop relationships with people living with dementia. And this is what this program is designed to do. And the art that's created is, is phenomenal. I mean, these are, some, these are just a few of the images that are created by people living with dementia. But what's really special is the relationships. 
to see these kids change from the first day they come in to the, to the end, and, and also to see people living with dementia change as well uh, is amazing. I think that I've, I've, I've tried to learn a lot about the relationships that develop, the intergenerational relationships, and these are some of the characteristics that, that, I, that I think are present. There's a spontaneity, there's a kindness, there's an encouragement, uh, there's imagination, humor, non-judgment. You see, uh, I, I, I'm amazed at, at, at what happens. Um, we know from research on this program that's been done by the Alabama Research Institute on Aging that students exhibit improved attitudes toward persons with dementia because of this program. Students exhibit decreased ageist attitudes. Students' uh, attitudes toward community service improve. Importantly, they show greater increases in empathy than parents. Um, persons living with dementia enjoy being with the students, creating art and sharing stories. They feel a sense of pride and accomplishment. And people living with dementia exhibit improved com communication skills. And care partners report a lower burden of care with uplifts. So we've taken the program. Uh, we do the program at the University of Alabama. We do it in Chicago uh, with high school students. Um, and we do it in Birmingham, Alabama, and we're looking at other parts of the country in which to, to, um, to do the program because we feel like it works. But the, the most important thing is it builds empathy in these kids and quality of life for the folks living with dementia. And I think empathy is the game changer. Um, empathy is the game changer. So Kate, um, the last part of the talk, uh, is lessons learned, and um, how how much time do we have? And I'll I'll um, I just want to check with you on that. As much as you want. How about that, Daniel? I think we're all, all right. spellbound. Well, I appreciate it. I, I won't take much longer, but I I've tried to outline. Um, excuse me, just a second. Let me make sure nobody's dying to. Okay, I got you. Okay, let me make sure nobody's calling me. I've tried to outline. Uh, some truths that I've learned uh, the art that dad has created. So I want to, I'm, I'm pairing the art with, with this, this first piece. This first piece is not dad's. This is a collaborative piece that was done by the students and their participant, Miss Katie, on the last. And this is very special to me right here, okay? Because Katie had Parkinson's related dementia. And she had a hard time doing the art. And so the first uh, session we had, Katie says, would you kids help me? So let me put my hand on your hand. You, where I want the brush to go. And so the next week, she said, now, uh, she said, would you uh, put your hands on my hand and guide my hand where the brush needs to go? So every art therapy session was guiding, but it was back and forth. And so for their collaborative piece, they decided that all the students in Miss Katie would put their hands together and paint that piece. And so Miss Katie put her K, her characteristic K, in the piece of art. And so I'll always remember Miss Katie and her students and the way they helped each other do the art. Um, so that's why I chose that. This is Papa's, we call this the broken jar. Um, care partners are curators of another person's museum of life. Um, and I think that if I, if I can see myself as a curator of dad's life or of those other people's lives, um, I'll probably do okay at it. This is dad's hummingbird. The innate value and dignity of human beings cannot be stolen by any condition or circumstance. To care with compassion, we must first believe that all people retain an incontrovertible identity. It's the students when they come into class, and it's the last thing we emphasize when they leave, because if you believe that, you'll treat somebody with compassion. Dad's Blue Jay. 
the beauty, vitality, and relational energies inside the very one living with dementia and provide the inspiration for the care partner's journey. I wouldn't have believed that, and I'm ap apologetically, I wouldn't have believed that if I had not had the experience with Dad. So what remained of that man was like lighting my day. So, you know, I can, uh, I can tell others that that, that, that care, give, care partnership, it's not giving, it's a partnership, it's reciprocal, and if there's not reciprocity there, somebody will burn out. And I learned the hard way. I should love and honor people in their current state rather than holding them accountable to be what my ego needs them to be. And there's dad's horse. I love that little horse, by the way. I need to allow persons living with dementia the opportunity to express themselves as completely as they can. One of my friend said, please do not complete my sentences for me. And so I try to learn not to do that. And we try to teach the students not to do that. Distractions must be minimized during interactions with persons who are living with dementia, you all know. And my dear friend, the Reverend Dr. Cynthia Hewling Hummel, who was just here last week, who is living with Alzheimer's disease, told me more than once, I can't pr process two conversations at the same time. And so um, I'm guilt I was guilty of this even last week. I said, Cynthia, keep me straight here. Um, we try to learn that. We should always look people in the eyes when they're sharing their stories. And we should realize that they may be sharing their stories without using words. Um, and this becomes especially true in later stages. Uh, I have found the intensity of the communication stronger in many cases when not a single word is exchanged. And this has been true in sitting at the bedside of people in hospice care or people in, in late stage. Uh, it's very powerful. One story needs to come out. When words fail, art in all forms can be a vehicle for expressing to explore creativity should be made available to everyone who's living with dementia, I believe. This is, we call this the rainbow cabin. This looks like Dad's old smokehouse that was behind the house. I'm sure it wasn't painted those colors, but he loved this painting and gave it to his sister. Nothing stirs the soul more than a feeling of belonging. We must do everything in our power to promote this kind of experience daily in people who are living with dementia. A feeling of belonging. Somebody said early in the conversation tonight, loneliness is one of the biggest to do something. Always try to remember the silent struggles of others which may lie buried beneath attitudes and behaviors we do not understand. That holds true for all of us, I guess. Um, I've behaved in, in ways that um, that are not admirable, and I think that's because of uh, added to those, some 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 of things that lie buried deep. I think any of us can say that to some extent. Rich present moment experiences open the pages of a person's narrative, bolster identity, and bring a sense of continuity to a person's exist, uh, existence. Bobby, who was one of our BATL partners, was asked for painting these. Uh, this is not Bobby's painting, but we were painting uh, uh, pumpkins. Bobby, what's your favorite holiday? 
and he said, a day like today. Now that's something we, we hold on to. Uh, so that says a lot to the students. Hey, you know what? It doesn't matter uh, what day it is. I'm having fun with you. Uh, I, you're here with me sharing my experience. And that's meaningful. Laughter is essential. It's a great equalizer. Medicine. Listening requires all of our senses, not just hearing. Um, dad, if dad was having a bad day, we could put in a DVD of the Carol Burnett show. And if he watched Tim Conway, who, by the way, just passed on, Tim Conway, that would pop dad out of his funk. And we'd all be there together laughing at Tim Conway. Um, Kathy Borey, who many of you may know, she's the author of A Long Hello, a beautiful book about her. In, Mothers in a different way to mother. Uh, and Kathy, Kathy learned to listen to the voice that coming out. Dad painted a ski man or a snowman on skis. I promise you that was out of his imagination because we don't have skiing snowmen in Alabama. They're just not down here. So um, that was an imagination thing for Dad. We mustn't take ourselves too seriously. Play is important at any age. It's essential to develop the practice of self-compassion. Naomi File, who I quoted a minute ago, the writer of the Validation Breakthrough, and just somebody who I think knows so much about this. The hardest part for me is learning to be independent in a dependent situation, says Naomi, who is taking care of her husband, Ed, who has Alzheimer's disease. And so self-compassion is very important. That other diagram there, um, talks about um, balancing being and doing, and that's something I struggle with. As a care partner, I should act as if my life is a mirror reflecting only the good qualities and true image of personhood and none of the toxicity of dementia. And that can be a challenge, but it's very important. There's no greater privilege than to help someone find his or her true voice and no greater crime than to silence it. Um, I think it's true. Culture change cannot occur if the voices of those who are living with dementia are not heard. I believe that very strongly and I laud all of you and commend all of you for making your voices heard. And uh, Kate Swapper, what an example you set for this. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm grateful and thankful that you're doing it. Do not take it personally if someone living with dementia offends you or hurts your feelings. Um, talk to the students about that all the time. And uh, it, requires, it requires compassion and insight. Empathy is the game changer in creating a culture of compassion and dementia care. Empathy increases when people allow themselves to have meaningful relationships with persons living with dementia. And it's especially important to facilitate this process in young people because I believe their lives the key to attacking stigma in the coming days and years. This is one of our favorite paintings of dads. It appears to be a boat washed up on shore with lovely flowers coming out of it. Um, though the requirements of care partnerships can sometimes bring out our worst, they can also bring out our best human qualities. And there's a beautiful book by Dr. Richard Morgan and Jane Tibbalt called No Act of Love uh, goes, uh, let's see, what is it called? No act of love is ever wasted. And in it, they talk about cultivating spiritual intentionality. And by doing that, they talk about, they mean getting past denial and resentment to acceptance and gratitude, choosing to look for opportunities to love more deeply in each moment of the ongoing care partnership. And that's what Dr. Houston, Jim Houston talks about 
uh, when he says, my dear, these will be the best days of our lives. That's what he told his wife, Rita, uh, because he wanted to try to make them as good as possible for the two of them. Dad uh, painted this uh, picture relatively late and was the last thing that he saw before he passed out of the world. And uh, we call it beyond the sunset. Reliance upon one's faith and spirituality can provide a deeper meaning to the journey through dementia for everyone involved. And studies bear this out. So, so research shows that tapping into one's faith uh, uh, both for those living with dementia, care partners, and healthcare providers. It has many, many health benefits. And so mindfulness and meditation is important. Meaningful relationships can be maintained with persons living with dementia, even at late stage. And presence is the most important characteristic of these relationships. Presence. Brain pathology is not the only determinant of well-being. The relational qualities of one's surroundings play a major role. And I borrow that from Thomas Kipling, and I think it is true. The strength of the ego's need to retain control is often proportional to the level of denial exhibited by a care partner. I think that's also true. And I'm living proof. It's much better to be kind than to be right. When in doubt, we should default to kindness, and when not in doubt, we should default to kindness. The need for generativity never goes away. We find this in art to life, art to life class. People want to give back. They want to help a younger generation. And so models of dementia care must address, must address that need. It adds to personhood. And I think we'd do well to remember the things we learned from old people, young people, wounded people, and disabled people. And I'm trying to take note. Life's about relationships, and that does not change if someone has dementia. In personhood, relationships and empowerment promote living well. Showing others back to themselves may be the greatest gift we can give them. And that's also been a mantra of, uh, of the care that we're trying to give. So I'll finish up now and tell you a few ways my practice has changed because of all this. So really having experienced burnout, uh, I've learned ways to guard against it. And I include wellness practices in my uh, daily walk, uh, self-compassion, mindfulness. I'm in nature a lot. Um, I try to strengthen the relationships that mean the most to me, try to sleep better. I'm still working on that one. I have not perfected that yet. Um, try to have a deeper faith walk, exercise, photography, writing poetry. I write a lot, I share a lot of that online. I try to eat more healthy and have gratitude and authenticity practices so that I don't burn out. Um, I, I try to address the person living with dementia first in all clinical interactions and the care partners and family second. When a person with dementia walks in my practice, my, my exam room, I acknowledge them first before anyone else. Okay, and I'm going to continue doing that. I spend as much time as I can and learn as much as possible from people living with dementia. And I count it a privilege to do so. I do a better job of uh, compassionately, more empathetically, and I try to provide resources and opportunities for respite, for, uh, for participation in groups, etc. And I try to do a better job with that. And I think that chain at Alliance Conference in 2017, and I heard five people on stage talking about their diagnosis experiences and about how terrible they all were. And it was very embarrassing to hear that. And so uh, I am preaching to my comrades that we've got to do a better job uh, with, with that. And so um, I'm thankful that uh, in the Mitch Action Alliance uh, and um, the American Academy of Neurology partnered last year in Los Angeles. We had a, a panel of people living with dementia for the first time at the American Academy of Neurology Conference. So neurologists could hear what people said about it. 
After the initial diagnostic assessment, assessment, I make less use of routine formal standardized clinical assessments. In other words, I don't put somebody through a mini mental status or a slums or a MOCA every day now. for that, but I don't care, okay? Because I think it's stigmatizing. And, and I can tell from interacting with this person and from talking to their care partners uh, a, a lot about how they're doing. And okay, I know things are going to get worse, so I don't have to prove to the person that they're getting worse in the clinical encounter. That's my feeling about it. I strive to always see the person, not the disease, while giving the disease its due acknowledgement. I strive to be non-judgmental non -judgment, non of care partners and others unfamiliar with the concepts that we've talked about today. And I try to share what I've learned with my colleagues. So realistically, what can we expect from our health care providers? Well, I've just listed a few things. And this is not a comprehensive list. But you can expect compassion and empathy. And if you don't get it, you should go somewhere else. You should find another provider. Um, they need good listening skills. They need to espouse person-centered care and uh, the importance of maintained relationships. They should interact with you, the person who's living with dementia, and not treat you as if you're not there. Uh, they should listen to care partner concerns, yes. They should have a good understanding of treatment options and ongoing research. They should have knowledge of available resources and supports, and they should have an accessible office staff. And I realize that it's gonna be hard to find all of that, uh, in a provider, but it, you, but you you deserve it, you need it, and it, and it's out there. And then, lastly, some suggestions for providers. And I realize there are not many providers on, on the call, but the diagnosis should be delivered to the person living with dementia and care partners accurately, in a timely fashion, unhurried, with compassion, empathy, educational resources follow-up, and an action plan of care and support. I truly believe that. I think that evidence-based supports should be recommended, uh, and I've listed some here, like occupational therapy, caregiver supports, exercise programs, cognitive stimulation sessions, uh, support groups, memory cafes, all those things that we know help somebody live well. Um, your provider should be able to recommend those or have somebody in their practice that knows how to get you plugged into some of that. The provider needs to promote brain health, promote safety while supporting independence. And services. They need to offer some support during those transitions that are inevitable, like in the hospital, out of the hospital, adult daycare, assisted living, those transitions are so tough, and we all know that. And they need to always ask the care partner. So, in summary, and to finish up, I love this quote by William Butler Yates. From mirror after mirror, no vanity is displayed. I'm looking for the face I had before the world was made. Dear world, if I could forget, please show me back to me. If I can show somebody back to them, because I realize their personhood is intact and uh, that they are a spiritual being. They're, they're, not, they're not a human being having a spiritual experience. They're a spiritual being having a human experience, as they are de Chardin. Then I'm going to do okay. Richard Rohr says, when the face of the other, especially the suffering face, is received and empathized with, it leads to transformation of our whole being. We are mirrored into life, not by concepts, but by faces delighting in us, giving us the beloved self-image we can't give to ourselves. Love is the gaze that does us in. How blessed are those who receive it deeply. And in closing, I'll tell you that I found my true face caring for my father and being a care partner to others who are living with dementia. And I started writing poetry because of dad's art. And I wrote this poem in the voice of my dad talking to me. Remember who you are, my child, who you were born to be. Let love be law in mind and heart. Let life be charity. 
As bandits begging hands assail your palisades of calm, let labor bring tranquility. Let healing be its bond. When death itself so stealthily advances through your days, let quiet faith be your resolve. Let living be your praise. Then when my spirit and my flesh within your heart, the finest part of me continues on. And I sure hope and pray that's the case. So it's a pleasure to be with y'all today. Uh, I hope I haven't talked too long, but I wanted to tell you about Pop and other people like you who I've learned a lot of, a lot about life from. So thank you so much.